it's very important to keep in mind, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? There is this fiscal thing about it. Ultimately, we want to make sure that music education is prevalent throughout the school systems in America. And that's something that has to be brought home as well, is that this is not frivolous. And that uh, everybody supports the idea of music education. They simply haven't put two and two together. Yeah. One of their kids is going to get rich at this. <laughs> you know, you have nothing to lose by starting a music program, and maybe a lot to gain for some of these students. Last night I was at, at dinner, and I was sitting with George, and he, he, he talked about the second component, which is public policy and changing public policy. And the first question he's going to ask is, well, of course, how much is it going to cost? And what is the financial benefit going to be? Can we measure it? And what's some of the, 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 the future efforts we need to make? George? Thank you. Normally, as an economist, I don't get to follow somebody whose uh, work is more complicated than my own. So this is a blessing tonight. Uh, we asked the question earlier, what is the effect, the real effect of music on the brain? And then the next question is, is what is the value of that effect? And really what we're talking about in that case is what is the net value? And I think as you look at the literature, you see a lot of discussion about effects, but very little discussion about value. It's not something that lends itself very well to... Uh, monetization. It's a very deep phenomena. It's spiritual. Um, I'm going to try to walk you through how, as an economist, I have uh, begun to wrap my head around this issue. And there are sort of two ways we generally think about it as economists. One is the private benefits of education. You say, well, maybe music will get you a better job. And then there are social benefits, which is a lot of what we talk about. In, in the literature and what we talk about tonight. And it's very important to keep those two things separate because they have different policy and economic implications. But these are, these are the two keys, and you have to think, because what you'll hear when we talk about the topic and when people talk about the topic is this jump around from the intrinsic value, which is music for music's sake, versus the instrumental value, and that is how does music impact test scores in mathematics. And then we turn to the evidence, and there's a ton of evidence on this. But there are some problems with the literature, and I want to point out what those problems are so that when you see it, you can evaluate it. Number one is selection bias. And this is probably the number one criticism of the bulk of the literature. In fact, there have been a couple of papers published that basically shot down or attempted to shoot down everything that's ever been written on this topic. But, you know, you go into a college, you, take, you, you measure the basket, men's basketball team, and they so you average out at 6'3", you go get the men on the college campus and they average out at 5'8", and then you conclude that basketball makes you taller. Um, the other issue with the literature, and I don't view this as being a problem with the literature, is the nature of the treatments. Okay, And by treatment, I mean the pill. What's the pill? And so you have to have try to match the treatment and then the outcome to what it is that you really want to do. And then you find out what the effect will be, and then you can quantify uh, its value. There's one good thing about the criticisms of the literature is now the intense focus on designing good experiments with good control groups, random control groups. And in the end, overall, music is the language of God, and its intrinsic value should never be set aside for what it does for mathematics. Thank you. Thank you, George.